This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening whatever time of day it is for you. For me, it's mid-afternoon when I record this episode and the sun is shining. It's a beautiful day here in the Tyne Valley near Newcastle-upon-Tyne. And again, this solo episode is where I look to build on last week's podcast episode and share two more clips. This time I'm going to share former England cricketer and senior leadership coach Jeremy Snape and multiple world champion martial artist and clinical hypnotherapist Stuart Wade. Jeremy goes on to highlight the importance of the psychological side to sport, where Stuart defines mental toughness in combat sports. I then again go on to look at a case study and another helpful tool from Compassionate Focus Therapy to help you or your clients manage the voice in their heads that little bit better. I'm also going to continue the theme of dealing with challenges and pressure too. I was playing professional cricket and playing international cricket in the one day side for England. And there were just some days where I felt bulletproof, confident, focused, you know, like a world beater. And occasionally that happened. Uh, I got man of the match on my England debut, hit the winning runs in a 2020 final, you know, was part of a team that won seven or eight trophies. So I had some real success, but there were also some moments of real panic and real low confidence and, and just buckling under pressure, really choking. There was definitely one in front of 120,000 people in India playing for England that I stepped out to try and be the hero in front of that enormous crowd. I mean, Lords is about 25,000, I think. And this was so many times bigger than that, you know, but the, the, uh, crowd screaming was like a you know reverberating through my sternum like a cheap school disco Uh, and and the sort of noise was deafening and I just remember running out Freddie Flintoff who was the only chance of England winning the game and then Harbhajan Singh was running up to bowl and he may as well have been bowling a hand grenade I wasn't watching it I completely panicked played a stupid shot and you know walked back to the pavilion getting pelted with onion barges and that was the sort of seminal moment when I realized that I'd spent thousands and thousands of hours talking about techniques and strategies and, you know, fielding positions and stances and backlifts and so little time actually talking about the emotional side, the psychological side and how my biggest opponent wasn't India or the crowd or Harbhajan Singh's Dusra. It was actually the voice that was in my head, which was louder than all 100,000 people put together. So Stuart, how do you see mental toughness and how, how it applies to combat sports? So in combat sports, mental toughness is, is a massive component because there are so many different variables depending on uh, the combat sport. You know, in boxing, for instance, you've only got punches to worry about, delivering your own and then hopefully defending your opponents. Kickboxing, you've got two more limbs to worry about with the kicks. And then if it, if it's Muay Thai or if it's MMA and there, there are so many more weapons at, at your disposal and at your opponent's disposal. And so having the mental toughness in, in a fight, in a contest is paramount really because you have to deal with so many stimuli. You have to address and deliver your strategy and execute your techniques well, all the while defending yourself and then overcoming any adversity. For instance, if if you take a good shot, you know, call it head, body, legs, depending on the, the style and the discipline that you're in, and it hurts, immediately we're, we're hardwired to kind of retreat, you know, to protect ourselves and, and retreat back and and not continue to go to the fire. And in combat sports, you have to kind of put the mask on almost and try and hide that if you if you do get hurt because your opponent is going to see that and they're going to sense that and jump on you, and sometimes literally. Um, and so you, you have to have that mental toughness 
in order to overcome that adversity and then still continue to fight and continue to try and win. So I noted how Jeremy mentioned right at the very end of this clip about how my biggest opponent wasn't India, nor the crowd, or Harbhajan Singh's Dusra. It was actually the voice in my head, which was louder than all 100,000 people put together. Now that shows the power of our thoughts. And Stuart mentioned how if you take a good shot, it hurts. Immediately, we're hardwired to retreat and protect ourselves and not go forward to the fire. So in both of these cases, there's a strong likelihood that you may be activated by fear, which is a threat stimulus. It's similar to the sight of a predator, which goes on to trigger this fear response in the brain, in the amygdala. It then activates areas involved in, in our motor functions, our motor skills, which are involved in fight or flight. Stress hormones are released and the sympathetic nervous system is also triggered. Our heart rate starts beating faster, our breath speeds up, and our mind goes racing, just as Jeremy states. And when it comes down to the mind, it can often be these critical, self-critical thoughts. The motivated cricketer or the fighter doesn't want to lose. They want to come out on top, and their mind is often just simply focusing on the outcome, the winning, the losing. Therefore, they can fall into this trap of punishing themselves for feeling like they do, for feeling scared or fearful. Self-defeating thoughts come to their mind automatically, and we can often get caught in past thinking in these moments about what has happened, and we can focus on our weaknesses, or we flip forward to the future where we worry about what might happen. And again, we look at this from a negative or a weak angle. Some people get into blame mode. They blame themselves. They're very, very harsh in their thought processes. And this happens to many people. And it's not helpful. As I mentioned earlier, it can be really self-defeating. So how do we get ourselves out of this? Let's go with the example of the cricketer under pressure due to the state of the game, the noise of the crowd, the fielders chirping at them, as was Jeremy's case. He's about to face his delivery, yet he's in fast mode with what feels like a thousand critical thoughts popping into his head right at that very moment. Thoughts like you're going to get bowled first ball. I'm rubbish at batting. He's a great bowler. Not a duck. I can't do that again. I may as well be back on the pavilion. Now, to overcome this, the first step is being aware of these critical self-thoughts, these unhelpful thoughts. For many people, these thoughts become internalized in a daily habit. And there's a, there's a strong likelihood that you aren't even aware of this. It's so automatic that you don't notice it. And if that is the case, you're going to just keep on repeating these mistakes, these thoughts when you are under pressure. So self-awareness is critical. And then we need to find ways to disrupt this automatic pattern. So we're going to assume that you are now aware of these harsh and self-critical thoughts. So we've got to look at ways to release them and fast if you're the cricketer about to face the baffling bowler like Harbhajan Singh, or perhaps the fast bowler who's about to put a quick, short delivery in, one method that you can do is buy yourself some time. You can go for a walk off the pitch, perhaps for 10 or 20 seconds, and this could be enough. But you're also going to need to incorporate a strategy that I'm about to go through. And this strategy is going to be something that you're going to have to practice away from the cricket pitch or from the football pitch, the golf course beforehand on numerous occasions. And then by doing so, you can embed it in. And during that 10, 20 second break, you'll be able to incorporate it very, very quickly. So in that time that you're having a walk off the pitch, we're going to look to alter and transform the nature of that critical inner voice into a more self-compassionate and a self-supporting one. So the goal of this exercise isn't to create a black and white approach to motivation or focus in which you see compassion as the good approach and self-criticism as the bad approach. It's to make you aware that how you feel when you use self-criticism to create motivation and focus to face that delivery. So I'm hoping that you'll be more open to using different methods, perhaps this method, and being more flexible in your thinking and to find ways to enhance your focus and your motivation. So this next step is going to be about reflection. You're going to need a pen and some paper for this. So if you're driving or out for a run, 
please do just make a mental note for later. Your job with the pencil or the pen and paper is to draw a person holding five to ten thought balloons. And then you're going to think about a situation when you're under pressure. Perhaps, just like Jeremy, the batsman walking in. And in these thought balloons, you're going to write down some self-critical words and statements that you might say to yourself. So, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to get bowled first ball. I'm rubbish at batting. He's a great bowler. Not a duck. I can't do that again. I may as well be back in the pavilion. These are the put-downs or the sort of put-downs, the self, some of the self-critical thoughts that the cricketer might think. So you dream up your situation and write down your self-critical thoughts. Then the aim of the game is to find a method to release these thoughts, or in this case, balloons. So how we do that is by doing a short visualization exercise. So please don't do this if you're driving a car or riding a bike. It's not going to end well. So simply, if you are in that, in that situation, simply just listen to this. However, if you are at home and you've got a comfortable place to sit down or lie down, feel free to follow through with this exercise. You're going to need to close your eyes. So I'll give you a moment. You might want to even pause the podcast right now. So you'll know it now. I'm going to talk a little bit more slowly than I normally do. So assuming you're lying or you're sitting down in a comfortable place and your eyes are closed, I'd like you to focus on your breath and different body parts. So perhaps your stomach to start with. And you notice as you inhale, your stomach rising. And as you exhale, your stomach releasing. You notice if your chest moves as you breathe in and breathe out. All the while, you allow your body, your head, neck, shoulders to simply soften and relax a little or a lot. And then I'd like you to visualize yourself holding all of these thought balloons. So feeling the string in your hands. And in my case, I'm holding five. These balloons all have writing on them. I'm rubbish at batting. He's a great bowler, not a duck. I can't do that again. I may as well be back in the pavilion. So I'm holding these balloons. You hold your balloons and picture these words in big writing. Each balloon is colored differently. Imagine the shapes and sizes of these balloons. And then what I'd like you to do is bring one of these thought balloons to your attention. So you're going to simply pay attention to one of these thought balloons. You're going to notice the balloon in your hand, the color of it. You're going to feel a string in your hand. You're going to clearly see the words and the writing of this particular thought. As you see the size of the balloon, and you're going to bring the words and the balloon closer and closer to you. As you then very slowly release your grip on the balloon and allow it to smoothly, very smoothly and slowly drift into the distance. Noticing it go further and further away, drifting more and more into the distance. Noticing what it's like when that thought disappears slowly and slowly into the distance. As you then take hold of the second thought balloon, and this time you're paying attention to the second thought. Again, you're holding this balloon softly, gently in your hands, or certainly the string. You picture a different color to the first balloon and a different size, perhaps. Again, the words are clear. You're bringing those words, that balloon, closer to you, the string closer to you as again you very slowly release the grip on the string and you watch 
and allow the balloon to slowly and smoothly drift and drift into the distance. Very slowly, the words will get smaller and smaller and smaller as it drifts far, far away, taking its time. And then the rest of the exercise would be, you would get your third balloon, your fourth balloon, your fifth balloon, and so on. And again, you get used to that feeling of allowing the balloons to drift away. And then you would open your eyes. So in this case, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes now. And if you have done this exercise, I'm wondering what it is that you do notice. Was it easy or difficult to visualize yourself holding the balloon, feeling the string, and then releasing these self-critical thoughts? Why is that, do you think? How do you feel now? Give it some thought. I'd then encourage you to practice this exercise often. It's a little bit like going to the gym. So if you wanted to bench press 100 kilos and you currently only bench pressed 50, you would need to go to the gym three, four, five times a week. This is very similar. If you are very self-critical, if you do this exercise once, it's unlikely to shift things. But if you do this exercise on a regular basis, it's going to give you more chance of lifting that 100 kilos and being less self-critical and performing much better under pressure. It's going to make you aware, much more aware of these critical thoughts in situations like the one that you've used. I'd encourage you to add thoughts on a regular basis and then get used to carrying out this exercise of releasing these self-critical thoughts. Get used to practicing visualization by yourself away from your from your cricket pitch or your football pitch, your golf course. And then as you become more and more comfortable with it, you can then go on to incorporate the exercise, the visualization exercise when you are under pressure. I would layer this though. So perhaps you would do it under pressure at first when you're in practice. And then bit by bit, add a little bit more pressure and more pressure so that you can do it in the middle. If you were a cricketer, you would do this as you walked away from the crease, when you were buying yourself some time, getting ready to bat, you could just imagine some of these balloons floating away. So then you feel calmer and more ready to face that delivery. And I have to say, I've tried this exercise with a number of clients now, and the vast majority have really enjoyed it. They found it massively helpful. It's meant that they'd be much calmer under pressure, that fear of failing, or that fear of making an error, or people disapproving of them has been significantly reduced. They've ultimately gone on to feel much more in control and have been better able to encourage themselves, which is, let's face it, a nice place to be, especially when you're looking to improve and achieve your potential. I really hope that this episode has been a nice additional layer to the first episode on this topic. Next week, I'll look to wrap up this mini-series by sharing another helpful technique for you to ponder. Enjoy your week ahead and releasing those balloons. Please do leave a positive review and a five-star rating if you can. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink for the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or the like. Enjoy your week ahead. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport-excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.